through Acts chapter number 2. Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, and we're going to begin in verse number 41. These are, for many of us, these are very, very, very familiar verses, great verses. Day of Pentecost, Peter preached, and um, the church was organized. Holy Spirit came in, put it together. Church was already started, of course, but it was organized here. And so this is a beautiful passage of Scripture, and keep in mind we've been preaching about the purpose of the church, and these scriptures give us some real understanding of that purpose. Notice in verse number 41, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers, and fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles, and all that believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men, as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the what? To the church, daily, such as should be saved. Our Father, who art in heaven, please bless your word this morning and speak to our hearts about your love, the church. And we ask, God, that our hearts would be more knitted, more committed to the local church than it has ever been in our life. Lord, we live in dark days. We are living in end times. And we are certainly living in a time where the church is needed like it's never been needed before. The church has been, has been indicted by the world as the problem. And yet, Lord, in their ignorance, they do not even understand that the church is the solution to the problem. And so help us to be the light of the world. Help us to be the salt of the earth. It cannot happen without a good old-fashioned local church. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much for standing. So I, we're talking about the purpose of the church. Last Sunday was I Love My Church Sunday. And, of course, what I emphasize is that Jesus loved the church, and so should we. Because the church is Jesus. Jesus is the head. We are the body. One of these days we are engaged to the Lord. One of these days because of the Holy Spirit of God. When we receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, we receive really what is considered to be the engagement ring. And so one of these days the Lord is going to come back for his bride. We are the bride. And one day we will be taken out of this earth. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. And we'll be taken out and we will, uh, we will be gathered in the clouds and we'll meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. Amen. And we're going to get married. There's going to be the marriage feast of the Lamb. And man, you say, what's going to be there? Anything and everything. We won't have to worry about diets then. Praise God. Spaghetti be right in the middle of that table and meatballs, and sausage, and everything else that's good for you. Amen? So, looking forward to that, but till that time, we are the, bri we are the bride-to-be. And we need to be making sure that we are within the confines of the church. And the church really is that entity, that or not just an organization, but the organism that God is put in place for us to be a part of so that we can begin to develop our spiritual lives. Most people are saved through the church. Amen. Now, I know there are people that have led the Lord outside of the church sometimes, but the majority of people are saved in some way through a local Bible-believing church. And I would even be so bold as to say that many a times it's through a good old-fashioned Baptist church. 
Baptist has always been fervent about witnessing, fervent about getting the gospel out, fervent about being true to the Word of God. I've kind of taken my own little census through these years. I'll meet people, and of course I'll, I'll talk to them. I'm from Faith Baptist Church, and, um, and then I'll ask them, boy, if you die today, are you 100% sure you would go to heaven? And sometimes they'll say, yes, I do. And I say, all right, how? How do you know that? Got to put them on the spot, amen? Just because they're saved doesn't mean they're saved. So, and then I'll say, well, I got saved, and they'll give me a pretty good testimony. And I'll say, boy, what, what kind of church did you get saved in? I'm going to tell you, 75% of the time, it's a Baptist church. Now, they may be going to an Assembly of God church now. They may be going to a Presbyterian church now. They may be going to some other type of church now. But it's just been always amazed me how many people have gotten saved through the ministry of a Baptist church. Amen? Just amazing. So, but the point is, I'm not preaching about the Baptist church. I'm preaching about the church. And so we're looking at the purpose of the church. Now, we live, we live in sad times when it comes to the church. Church attendance it has declined. It is declining. Less people go to church now, and I'm talking about believers, go to church now than they ever have done so. One of the problems is, is because some have swallowed the fact that the church is non-essential. world says it's non-essential. Christians' actions show it is non-essential to them. Did you get that? The world says the church is non-essential. A lot of Christians show by their actions that they believe it is non-essential but the purpose of the church. And not only that, is, not only is attendance declining in America, you can look it up and study yourself, church services are declining. There are, most churches today have less services than they did 20 years ago. Most churches have gone to a one-service Sunday. Sunday morning, hour and a half long, majority of it is worship, 20-minute sermon, and that's it. You do your own study. You go back 20, 30, 40 years ago, most churches, and I'm not saying just Baptist, I'm talking Baptist, Presbyterian, Methodist, uh, Assembly of God, Southern Baptist, whatever the case may be, most of them had Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night being Bible study or prayer meeting. You, don't take my word for it. You check it out. Most churches had several services during the week. You say, why they do that? Because we need it. Amen. And they understood that. It's not less Bible, it's more Bible. It's not less church, it's more church. As we see the day approaching. And so, and, and, and by the way, it is the place where you put your family in to protect them. Look at the church. These four walls are a fortress to protect you and to keep you and to help you, hopefully, to raise your family the way you want to raise it according to the Word of God. We're just here to help you and to preach to you and teach you how you can do that. And so the church is vital. And as somebody has wisely said, as goes the church, so goes the family, and so goes the nation. Right. Why in the world is the family in decline? It's because of their, the people aren't going to church anymore. And believers aren't going to church anymore. They feel like they don't need it. They got other things they can do on Sunday. Family came, can't go to church. Birthday party, can't go to church. Tickets to the game, can't go to church. Last time I heard, the Bible says this is the Lord's day. And God in His wisdom said on the first day of the week that you need to come together as a church, a local assembly, and get your bucket full so you can get ready for the week. And then we just, a lot of churches decide we're going to have Wednesday. We need a stepping stone to Sunday. We need to get kind of revived even more on Wednesday. I'm a little fired up. Have you noticed that? Because I've been reading too much about what's happening to the church. And it just makes me sad, but it also makes me mad. Because it's, 
It's Christians that are doing it. Don't point at the world, point at the church. It's the church's fault why things are going the way they are. And we'll see that in a minute. i got to get going here. I said I was going to be done this Sunday. Forget it. <laughs> By faith is on the back burner. It's cooking, though. Don't worry. It's still cooking. But we, we need to really focus in on the church. It is so important. So we talked about the purpose of the church. And we said last week it is to help us to develop our spiritual life. You cannot grow as a Christian. I'm sorry. You can't grow as a Christian not being in church. You're not going to grow. Don't come to me after the service. Try to tell me that's not true. It is true. That's why right after they got saved, as we'll see in a minute, they were added to the church. They weren't added to some para church ministry. They were added to the church. And, that was, and they needed to be in the church because that's the body of Jesus Christ. So the first thing we learned is the, it helps us to develop our worship, our worship, our relationship with God. Bible talks about in Acts chapter 2 that they were break, they would continue, continue, continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and in prayer. Prayer is helping you to develop your relationship to God. Then it says in verse number 47, they were praising God. Prayer and praise. They were praying, they were praising God. Why? Because they were in a church and they were developing their relationship with God. They were learning how to love God. And that is the first and biggest and most important thing. You've got to fall in love with Jesus. And that's what's missing in so many Christians. Love the Lord with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. And that's the first thing that every Christian needs to focus on. Focus on Jesus. Focus on loving Jesus. I was eight, 19 years old when I got saved. And, um, and I got in church, and for the first year of my Christian life, I, I, 19 years old, what, what does every 19-year-old guy want? A girl. If you're normal. I'm going to stop right there. If you're normal, but for the first year, I, I knew I didn't know anything about the Christian life. I knew I wasn't worthy to even have a relationship with any Christian girl. And I said, you know what, for a whole year, I'm not messing with a girl. I am gonna, I'm going to mess with God. And I took that year, and I worked on my relationship. I worked on my service. I worked on being the kind of Christian I needed to be. And that's the first thing you need to develop is your love for the Lord. Develop your love for Him. But then number two, we'll get right into it here. The second thing is this. You need to develop, to de why do you need to be a part of a church? What's the purpose of the church? To develop my relationships. To develop my relationships. I can tell you where you are going as a child of God according to what your relationships are. Look at if you would Acts chapter 2, verse number 41. It says, then they, we read it a moment ago, then they that gladly, which means they did it of their own free will, man, they were thrilled to death to get saved. It says, then they that gladly received his word. What word? The word that Peter had preached. He preached a good old Old Testament salvation message. And the Bible says they repented. They trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. And then look what it says. And they, uh, gladly received His word. They got saved. Were, what's the next word? Baptized. So right after they got saved, they got baptized. Now baptism has nothing to do with salvation. Amen? Amen. It is a public profession of your faith. If you don't get baptized, you're still going to heaven. But it is a way that you publicly demonstrate that I am a child of God. And when you get into that water and you get in there and you go down and you come back up, it's a picture of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you're saying, that is what my faith is in. My faith is not in a church. My faith is not in a cross. It's in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So that's why the same day, 3,000 people got baptized the same day. Man, you know, I was reading something. Where did they get them baptized? Everywhere. Anywhere there was water, man, they were getting baptized all over the place. Why? Because they wanted everybody to know 
that we are trusting Jesus as our Savior. They were not ashamed of the Lord. Amen. And if you're saved and you have not been baptized, you need to do that next week. Amen. Get baptized. It's a public prayer. And you'll never grow until you get baptized. Right. You'll never grow. I got saved May 6, 1979. I didn't get baptized till the end of June because I got saved out of the Catholic Church. And for whatever reason, I was stubborn about baptism. I already got baptized. And I fought it for a while. It was my own little rebellion. But I finally realized I'm wrong. And I don't do that very often. <laughs> and uh, I was, I'm wrong. And I told preacher, I said, preacher, I'm sorry. You're right. I'm wrong. The Bible's right. I'm wrong. I'm going to get back. And, and boy, I got to tell you, after I got baptized, brother, too, I just started growing, man. I mean, good night. Just God was working in my life. But as long as I was stubborn enough to not do what God, once you stop obeying God, you stop growing. All right? Then, then look what it says. And, and, and the same day they did it, the same day. Some people say, well, don't they need to come to church for three or four weeks? Same day. There were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So they got saved, they got baptized, they were added to the church. So that's the only thing it takes to become a member of the church. You've got to get saved and you've got to be baptized. Amen? Once you do that, you can be a member of the church. Now look at Acts chapter 2, verse number 42. And they, oh boy, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. And what's that next word? Fellowship. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse number 44. And all that believe, what, the, what is those next two words? Were together and had all things common. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse number 46. And they continuing daily, notice with what? With one accord in the temple and breaking bread from what? House to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Heart. What happened? Well, they got into the church, and what, when they got into that church, they began to develop the right relationships in their life. They started building relationships within the confines of that church. They began to build relationships with other believers. They began to build relationships with people that are going in the same direction that they are going. People that want the same thing that they want. People that, that, that know the Lord like they knew the Lord. And so they began to develop these wonderful, wonderful relationships. The Bible says daily with one accord. So they did it with one mind, but that word accord also means with passion. There was passion in their heart. That they wanted to, this, this, is their, this is their church now. This is their people now. They were Jews, but now they're Christians. Amen. And now we've got to develop different relationships now. Uh, iron sharpeneth iron. We've got to sharpen each other now. We've got to build each other now. So that's what they did. So they were fellowshipping together daily with one accord, with one mind. And, and uh, uh, attending what remaining... And then it says this, con, con, they continued steadfastly. Continued steadfastly. What does that mean? That means attending one, remaining by his side, not leaving or forsaking. And the word means a steadfast, single-minded fidelity to a certain course of action. So they got saved. And they purposed in their heart, man, we are going to go in this direction. They continued steadfastly. So in other words, they got it. These people got it. And the amazing thing is, and I've said this many times through the years, the amazing thing is we have 3,000 people got saved and continued passionately, fervently, to go to everything the church was doing. So they went, they continued steadfastly in what? The apostles' doctrine. That means the teaching and the preaching. 3,000 showed up for every single service. Hey, if every church had every member show up every service, it would be unbelievable. 
But that's what happened. 3,000 showed up Sunday morning. 3,000 showed up Sunday night. 3,000 showed up for Sunday school. 3,000 showed up for the Wednesday night service. I'm trying to be funny here. And then look what it says. And, and breaking the bread. Uh, 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 I'm sorry, I'm losing my place here. Uh, continues steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship. So if, uh, if it was Brother Tudor's birthday it, that night, guess what? 3,000 people showed up. And sang. 3,000 people sang, happy birthday to you. Amen? Fellowship. And then it says, and they continue in the breaking of bread. That means when they had the Lord's Supper. Everybody showed up for the Lord's Supper. And then it says in prayers. And this is the, this probably is the biggest thing of all. I mean, a lot of people come to services. A lot will always come to fellowship as long as they're food. But prayers. When they had a prayer meeting, 3,000 people showed up for prayer meetings. Is it no wonder how fast that church grew? How those individual Christians grew? They went to every service. They went to every fellowship. They went to every time the Lord's Supper was taken. They went to every prayer meeting. 3,000 people. And it exploded. There isn't a church in America that wouldn't explode if th that church had exactly what this church had. Amen. Members that continued steadfastly, with one accord, with one mind, with one passion and desire in their heart. Uh, commentator Albert Barnes wrote this, they, they, persevered, they persevered in or they adhered to. This is the inspired record of the result that any of these apostatized is nowhere recorded and is not to be presumed. Apostatized mean they fell away. And we've all seen people come to church, stood up here, got saved, got baptized, and never seen them again. Right. Unfortunately, we've all seen that. Albert Barnes is saying, nowhere do we see or is it to be presumed that any of these fell away. They all continued steadfastly. By the way, that shows something about their salvation. Amen? And then, look, though they had been suddenly converted, though they were suddenly admitted to the church, though they were exposed to much persecution and contempt and to many trials, yet the record is that they adhered to the doctrines and duties of the Christian faith. And so they continued steadfastly in the apostles' Fellowship. So they got saved, added to the church, and they began developing a relationship first with their God, prayer, praising, prayer, praising. They developed a love for their God and a relationship with God's people. A Christian needs to love God, but that Christian also needs to love God's people. A Christian needs a relationship with God, first and foremost. But a Christian also needs a relationship with God's people. And, by, and that is really the only place that that can be accomplished is in a church. It's the only place that you can develop your love for God and develop your love for for people, for God's people, and where you build your relationship with God and you will build your relationship with God's people, that is the purpose of a church, to provide. Man, how, some of you, how many went to Boy Scouts or Cub Scouts? Man, you got into Boy Scouts and Cub Scouts, you got around guys, and man, you did things outdoors, you learned things, you got badges and did all that. And, and I mean, there were not other places you could do that. That was what you did in those Boy Scouts. And that's what the church's purpose is, developing that relationship, developing that, that love and desire for God and God's people. Uh, 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 by the way, it is a sign that you are saved. Look at 1 John chapter 3, verse number 14. 
1 John chapter 3, verse number 14. 1 John chapter 3, verse number 14. Looky here. Notice what it says now. We know. And by the way, that's one thing I love about 1 John. It, it, it constantly says, we know, we know, we know, you know, you know, you know. I've always told people, if you're doubting your salvation, what you need to do is you need to book, read the book of 1 John five to seven times, underlining we know, because 1 John will show to you if you know that you're saved. And here's how you know. One of the ways you know, there are several things you can know that you're saved, but this is the biggest one right here. We know that we have passed from what? Death unto what? That's salvation. Because we... What? Do I need to explain that to anybody here? But look what it says. He that... What's the next word? Loveth. What's the next word? Not his brother abideth in what? Death. That means you're not saved. If you say you're saved and you don't want to go to church, I don't know that you're saved. If you don't love God's people, if you'd rather be around worldly people than God's people, I, I, again, I don't know your heart. God knows your heart. All I know is what the Bible says. Okay, so if you, if you got saved, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, glory to God. But you don't want to go to church and you don't want to be around other Christians. My friend, read the book. Read the book. I don't know about you, but I, I did not like church before I got saved. But after I got saved, I loved church. I couldn't wait to get to church. I dreamed of going to church. It was the longing of my heart. I was in the military, going out in the field. And, man, I would think, man, I can't wait till Sunday to get to church. Amen. Actually, Saturday to get to church and go out, go door knocking and visiting and things. I couldn't wait to go to church. Wednesday, I couldn't wait. Man, I get to go to church tonight. Amen. And I'm not kidding. That's the way I felt. You say, Pastor, you're trying to get me to doubt my salvation. Only if it's true. Only if it's true. You've got to ask yourself, why don't I want to go to church? Why do I have to fight to get to church all the time? Now, it could be you're saved and you're in sin, and that would definitely take away your desire to go to church. But it's one or the other. It's one or the other. And that's what he said. So if you, if you love God's people, then that's evidence that you are saved. And if you don't love God's people, then that's evidence that you may not be. Amen? Amen. It's evidence you may not be. Fellowship means partnership, participation, uh, social intercourse, communication, communion, distribution. Fellowship of the church, which is the purpose of the church, provides me friends and People for, for younger kid for younger ladies and younger men, it provides older men and older ladies that can help to mentor, encourage, and strengthen. Hey, the church provides the fellowship that every believer needs, especially new believers, new young converts. Uh, fellowship is simply sharing our lives with one another, loving one another, praying for one another, edifying one another, rebuking one another, reproving repro one another exhorting one another, giving to one another. You know what appealed to me about the church even before I got saved? I went to church and, um, and I, I was mad. I didn't like what I heard, but, but there was something that just kept pulling me back. And of course, that was the Holy Spirit and truth. But the one thing that, one of the things that really attracted me to the church I got saved in, it, it reminded me of my family. It, it had a family atmosphere to it. And I grew up in a great family. 
this wonderful family. All my cousins, everybody were all around us. We all lived on the same street. And it just we, we enjoyed being with each other. We had fun being with each other. And, and, and being in the military, I, was, I missed my family. I missed my home. I missed my cousins. I missed my aunts and uncles. I missed them all. And, and so, but, I, you know, for a couple of years, I, I'm in the military. I got, you know, suck it up, Joe. Amen. <laughs> Quit being such a wimp. And then I got to this church. And I started watching people and seeing friendship and people really loving each other. And I thought, I, I went to a church before that, but I never saw that in that church. Pretty much the church I went to before I was saved, you walk in, you sat down, you up and down every once in a while. And then you went home. I didn't know anybody in the church. Skate down the aisles because it was cold. And I'm not talking about temperature. There wasn't love there. There wasn't like people wanted to build relationships. There wasn't anybody standing at the door and say, man, it's so good to have you here today. You go to the door and you felt, all of a sudden you felt cold. Because there wasn't any kind of a family relationship there. But then I got to the West Coast Baptist Church of Vista, California, and I saw these people, and they were kind and gracious. I wasn't saved. I, didn't, I would definitely look different than I look now. And, man, they came up to me. They shook my hand. They offered me rides. They said, hey, why don't you come over to the house after church and eat? Now you're talking my language, amen? Oh, my. There were like four or five families that would take turns taking servicemen to their home. And I mean, roast beef and, oh, my goodness. <laughs> Wonderful. And I just felt like it was a family. And then after I got saved, then it really it became my family. They were truly my brothers and my sisters. And the older one became like my mother. Or the older men like my father. And they encouraged me and strengthened me. Being a born-again believer and a member of a church is like being a part of a family. And you need to treat it like a family. Sunday school, we meet as a family. Sunday morning, we meet as a family. Sunday night, we meet as a family. Tonight after church, we'll have... A birthday party with Brother Tudor like a family does. What, why do we go to, what's the purpose of the church? To develop our worship of God, but to develop our relationship. Because relationships have a big part in your spiritual growth, in your maturity. It just makes sense. We have the same salvation, the same Lord, the same Holy Spirit, the same power living and surging in our lives. We're all going to heaven. We're going to spend eternity together. Just make sure this is where I want to be. I know this purpose of the church was what helped me so much in grounding me. I didn't have a family. I didn't have parents that were encouraging me, you're saved now, Joe, now you need to get to church. I didn't have that. I was all by myself. And grounding me and keeping me from being overpowered by the world around me and the devil. In the military, the environment, my relationships were not conducive to living the Christian life. The relationships that I had didn't want me to go to church. They would constantly try to talk to me, Joe, don't go to church. Come on, go out with us this Sunday. We're going here. We're going there. Constantly not wanting me to live for God. Constantly fighting me. Tempting me. I remember we were, uh, I lived out in Oceanside, and, and we had a condominium right down there in Oceanside, right on the beach there. And, and so we'd drive in every day, and um, there'd be two in the front, three in the back, and I remember that Sunday night, pastor preached an amazing message. And, and I remember I just, boy, I just really made some decisions that night. 
Well, man, you know, and the funny thing is, after I got saved, the pressure became even greater. And the attacks greater and more. I, I mean, I could stand here for an hour and tell you, man, things started happening in life that never would have happened before. And it was the devil. He wanted to take me down. And that's one of the reasons why I couldn't wait to get to church. But they, they didn't want me to live for God. And the devil used them in every way he could to try to stop me. I remember we were in the car, and if you know, if any of you have been to Camp Pendleton, you know you go through the gate, but you still have usually 25 minutes to get to your camp there in, in Camp Pendleton. There were several camps within Camp Pendleton. And so we're going, and all of a sudden, somebody takes out a, a, a joint, a marijuana cigarette, and lights it, light, lights it. And the driver, and then the person here, I'm in the middle, back here, and then the person behind got it, and then, and I didn't want to make a scene, I, I didn't want to do that, but that uh, a person passed it to me, and, and I just took it, and I passed it to the next person. And then all of a sudden, somebody said, said, why didn't you take, take some? I said, well, I, I don't want to. Well, why don't you want to? I said, I just, I just don't want to. He said, it's going to church, huh? I said, what do you mean? Amen. He said, but ever since you started going to church, he said, You're, it's like you don't like us anymore. And that wasn't truth. I, I was changing. Right. And they said, what, 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 do you, what do you think? You think you're better than us? I said, absolutely not. I know I'm not better than you. I said, I just don't want to do it. I made a decision this Sunday and I, I, I told the Lord, I'm not going to do this ever again, Lord. And so they said, well, okay, if, if you don't want to be with us anymore, then, then why, you just ought to just get out of this car. And so they stopped the car in the middle of nowhere. And he got out and opened, obviously opened the door and said, all right, get out. And I said, all right, I will. And I got out. And they, he got back in and shut the door, and they drive off. And they left me. I had to walk all the way to work. But I walked with a smile. Amen. Because you know what? Because I knew I had done what was right. Amen. I took a stand Amen. against those that were trying to take me down. And by the way, never hung around those guys again. By the way, they didn't want to hang around me anyways. They want nothing to do with me anymore. I was a square, amen, and was happy to be one. What am I saying? I am saying that I found out very quickly what good things God was doing in my life was usually lost quickly because of the relationships I had outside of the church. And I learned very quickly, I needed to establish, I needed to develop new relationships, and that's what that church did for me. It was, that's what the church is for. The church is designed to help you to get new friends, new relationships that's going to help you to grow in the Lord. Amen? Amen. Look, real quick here. Look at, uh, uh, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. It's only... Six minutes after 12. I usually get done at 12, so give me about 10 more minutes, okay? All in favor, say aye. aye. Anybody opposed? <laughs> it is so carried. All right. Look, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 6. I'm sorry, what did I say? 6. Look at, look at these verses. People are afraid of these verses, but these verses are teaching what I'm trying to preach to you right now. Look what it says. Be ye not unequally yoked together with what? unbelievers now that principle is taken from the book of Deuteronomy chapter number 22 where the law was that the Jews could not the Israel could not yoke up an ox with a with a with a horse they could not hook up two different yoke up two different animals and so they could not be unequally yoked. So here's what he's saying. He's saying don't be unequally yoked up with somebody who is an unbeliever. Typically this is used concerning marriage. In other words, a, a, an unsaved, a, a saved young man shouldn't marry an unsaved young lady. 
and a young unsa- a saved young lady shouldn't marry a unsaved young man. Amen? That's what he's saying. Or business. That could be used in business. Or it could be used just simply in your relationship. But you should not yoke up with people who are unbelievers because they are going to influence you in the wrong way. That's why, again, that's why God gave us the church. That was the purpose of the church. So you don't need the friends out there anymore. You need to build relationships within that church so you can grow, mature, and be what Jesus wants you to be. Does that mean that you are to uh, not help people that are unsaved or never get around people that are unsaved? Absolutely not. I don't have time, but I can show you that God wants you to be around those that are unsaved and so you can influence them to get saved. But look what he says. Does that make sense to everybody? Amen. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness or lawlessness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And these are all rhetorical questions. We already know the answer. And what concord or agreement hath Christ with Belial? Belial is the devil. I mean, what agreement does Christ and the devil have? None. Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye, for ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And uh, wherefore come out from among them. Who's the them? The unbelievers. He's, he's not saying that you don't ever, you guys, good guys you work with. And they're unsaved. That doesn't mean you shun them. No, that would be the dumbest thing. No, befriend them. Be uh, be gracious to them. Talk to them. But you do it for the purpose of trying to help them to know the Lord. To get saved. But those guys that you work with who are unsaved and doing wrong things, you ought not go out with them after, after work. You ought not go places with them in the weekend. Pastor, this sounds pretty radical. No, it's biblical. It's not radical. You ought not do that. That's what he says here, doesn't it? Come out from among them. Need I say more? Come out. Look, look. And be separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing. And then look what he says. This is very interesting. And I will receive you. Now, wait a minute. They're already saved. So what's he saying? Well, look. And will be a what? A father unto you. And ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. See, there is a spiritual benefit. When you come out from the wrong influences in your life, and you begin to see your life more in tune with what the Bible says, teaches and you start to become a good Christian, living for the Lord, loving the Lord, then, okay, how many here did something wrong one time? Your dad, and, and, and your dad was kind of upset at you and your mother was upset at you. And for a while there, you just felt like there wasn't a very good relationship there. Anybody ever felt like that? Well, more than once. Yeah, I believe that with you, Brother Bixby. Now, now l- listen to me. It wasn't till maybe you, maybe your dad said, you go to room and you think about what you did and you come back to me when you're ready to apologize. Now, during that time, you weren't ready to apologize. That, that wasn't a really close relationship. But boy, once you were willing to apologize and go to dad and say, dad, I'm sorry. And son, that's, that's all I wanted to hear. Hey, let's go out and get an ice cream. Let's go fishing. Amen. When you build the right relationships that help you to be a better Christian, you know what it helps you? It helps you to build a more intimate relationship with God. God says, I want to be like a father to you. I want to treat you like you're my son and like you're my daughter. But if you're hanging around the wrong people and you're not building the right relationship, you're probably going to start talking the wrong way and acting the wrong way and going the wrong places. And God says, man, I'm not going to be able to be the father I want to be to you. Does that make sense, everybody? That's what God wants. That's why the church is so important. It helps to build that in our lives. It supplies 
It applies to any relationship in this world that influences us. And when we join the church, we get around these wonderful believers who help us to be the Christian God wants us to be. The principle is this. We are to be in the world, but not of the world. In other words, we're, we're, supposed, we're supposed to be in the ship, but on top of the water, we don't want the water in the ship. And that's what the Christian life is about. Being godly, having a loving relationship with the Lord, having a godly relationship with other people who are going in the same direction and not hang, being around people who are going to influence me in the wrong way. Man, I'm so glad that I got saved in a church where people loved me, reached out to me, and helped me and encouraged me to be a man of God. And that's what the purpose of the church is. Amen? Amen. And oh my soul, to, if you don't come to church on a consistent basis, you're going to struggle in your life. Especially if you have the wrong kind of friends and relationships outside of the church. Let's bow for prayer. Our Father, we thank you, Lord, that you have a wonderful purpose for the church to develop our love for you, our relationship with you, but also to develop a relationship with other believers. And thank you for a place that we can come and we have people who are like faith, and like mind, and going in the right, right, same direction. And Lord, we can just help and challenge and encourage each other. Now our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I wonder if there's anybody here this morning that you have not yet received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. You have not truly been born again. Maybe the Holy Spirit spoke to your heart and said, you know what, you're not saved, and you need to get saved. And if that is your case, then guess what? You can get saved right now. You can receive the Lord Jesus Christ right now. You don't need a special service or a special time. Now is the time. Today is the day of salvation for you, and you can come and get that taken care of today. Is there anybody that say, Pastor, I'm not saved. I know I'm not saved, but I want to be saved. I want to know that when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. Would you lift your hand up good and high? Pastor, that's my need this morning. All right. Then secondly, I wonder this morning, you'd say, hey, you're a child of God, you know you're saved, but you'd say, you know what, Pastor, I am not coming to church like I should and developing the right relationships like I know I should. And God has convicted me about that. I need to be more faithful to church. I need to be more steadfast in the church. Continue steadfastly because I want for me, I want for my spouse maybe, I want for my children maybe, I want to have the right relationships sharpening and encouraging and building our lives so we can live for God like we know we should. Is there anybody say, Pastor, that's my need this morning God spoke to my heart about that. Would you pray for me? Would you lift up your hand good and high and say, Pastor, that's my need. Amen. Boy, I've been there. And you can lower your hand. And by the way, it is still the case for me. Man, if I got out of church and I started hanging around the wrong people, I guarantee you this preacher would probably start doing the wrong things also. You don't just, for a little, early years, need the church. You need the church from the day you get saved to the day you leave this planet because you constantly need good relationships in your life to build your life. Now, Father, you saw those hands, and please, Lord, help them to follow through with what that hand meant when they raised it.